I would like to welcome Amy Gray Cunningham to the podcast today. Amy is an intuitive healer and an Akashic Records practitioner. She helps people understand who they are at the soul level to begin living the life God and our souls intended us to live. Oh, we love to hear it. She believes we are the creators of our own experiences. Therefore, we manifest the life that we desire. Welcome, Amy. Why don't we start by just having you introduce yourself and telling us a little bit about how you got into the work that you're currently doing. Well, thank you, first of all, for having me on your show. I am super excited about it. I'm very honored. So thank you. I got into the work spirit led, I guess. <laughs> it's it's a lifelong process. And it started, well, I mean, back when I was really young, I can remember feeling like I just didn't belong anywhere. And I wasn't quite sure why everybody else seemed to get it but me. And <laughs> so I used to joke around that, uh, that the day God handed out you know, the book of life and how to live life before I incarnated, I was skipping that class because I figured I knew it all and I don't, (laughs) so I didn't get it. And I grew up for most of my life, just not getting it and feeling kind of like a a square peg trying to fit into a round hole. And it just never worked. Then when I had my son, he's 27 now. (laughs) Good gracious. Almost 30. Can't believe that. Uh, life changed for me and I became a mother. I was responsible for another little human being. And I remember looking at this, this, this little baby while he wasn't little, he was a big boy. He was nine, five, but I remember looking at him thinking to myself, oh my God, what am I doing? You know, what am I doing with this? And so I just kind of looked at him. I said, if you can work with me, I'll work with you. Cause I have no clue what we're doing, but together we'll figure it out. And he did. He worked with me all his life. Bless his heart. He's, he was a good, he was a good boy, eh, is a good boy. <laughs> but my husband and I got married in 2009 and 2011, the beginning of January, he was telling me about a friend of ours. Well, he knew her. I didn't. Um, but she was one of the, the popular cheerleaders in high school. <laughs> And she had posted on Facebook that she was looking for a kidney for her brother, David. And by this time I had started a meditation process and I was learning about my spirituality. And so I journal and I've always journaled since I was real young. Uh, I've always been into writing and reading. It just always fascinates me. And so I've always journaled, but then I started learning to meditate And so I was doing that as well. So I had started this practice and it had been going on for a couple of years. And so I started asking God, use me however you want to. I am here. Let me be of service. Whatever it is you ask, I will do. (laughs) Be careful what you ask for because you just might get it. And I, or Chuck was telling me about this, this, this need for David and how he needed a life-saving kidney. He was literally on his deathbed. And I said, I hope somebody steps up to help him. And right at that moment, I heard very clearly, very audibly, Amy, that person will be you. I get chills as I say it now. And I'm like, thank God I was in the kitchen by myself. Uh, Because I looked around like, what just happened? Because it was as clear as you and I sitting here talking now. It was definitely not my voice definitely not something I would say to myself. I was no way I wanted to give away a body part. I didn't even think I could. So that was definitely not on my radar. And so I kind of set it aside, but that, that was very persistent. And I kept looking on Chuck's Facebook page to see if anybody stepped up to help him, but me, (laughs) please, please somebody else. And so I asked God, I said, okay, send me a sign. I need a sign. And he, I heard, well, the next day I found out for some strange reason, and I don't even know why I found out that my blood type was O positive. And then I was on uh, Jennifer's Facebook page and she had, somebody had asked her what David's blood type was. And she said, O positive. And I said, oh shit. 
<laughs> that was my sign. So I'm like, okay. So I told my husband, honey, I've been thinking. <laughs> I think I need, I'm being called to, to donate a kidney and I'm just going to fill out the application. It's not going to go anywhere. You know, I'm sure I'm going to be, I mean, I was a drug user in high school. And I mean, I didn't really, I mean, I was a runner, but I wasn't, I didn't really take care of my body per se. So I really honestly did not think that I would get approved. <laughs> Little did I know. Um, <laughs> in June of 2011, I was being wheeled in to donate a kidney to David, whom at that point I had met, but a few weeks prior, I did not know. And we were a perfect match. We were a one in 20 million match. Wow. One in 20 million. I know in your, um, what in researching you, that's like a sibling that's yes. so close to match that it would be, wow. Unexplainable. Yes. And my brother and sister joked around. They always said that I was the milkman's baby. So they wondered <laughs> if mom and, Dave and Mr. Ensley had ever met. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. And, and David is doing well. He just found out that, uh, last weekend, this past weekend, actually, that his youngest daughter, Leslie is going to have a baby girl. So oh, wow. who is a grandfather to little Mason, who is a little boy, obviously a little boy. And he's just started kindergarten or first grade now. So, I mean, David's been around for all of these experiences and now How wonderful. Yeah. And now, you know, there, there's a little girl that's going to come into the world. That's going to get to know her papa. And so like for anybody out there, who's ever considered potentially donating, I mean that it's scary, obviously. And, and mm -hmm. I'm sure you know that, but was there any sort of an adverse health consequence for you because you did it? Or is there anything that you have to do in terms of like a protocol with water or anything in order to be healthy now? Or is, are you fine? I've always drank a lot of water. I mean, like I said, I was a runner, so I was constantly hydrating. And I think that is key to one, having good kidney health. My kidneys, the two of them worked better than somebody with two healthy kidneys. I mean, it worked, it was so my one kidney works like somebody that has two now, mm. because what happens is when you take one kidney out, the other one compensates for the missing one. So it, it grows. Um, and my kidney function was extremely high. It was like a 0 0.3, which normally it's anywhere from a 0 0.9 to a 1.2 or something like that. So I was well below my kidney was my both of my kidneys were functioning the exact same. So now my kidney function is anywhere from a 0 0.6 to a 0 0.9. Wow. Um, and the only thing I can't really do is take ibuprofen mm -hmm. or any um, NSAIDs because that process is through the kidney. Now I do take it from time to time when needed. My only, the only thing that I can say that really affected me was when I, when I had COVID the second time. I got really sick and my teeth were hurting like crazy. So I took a lot of ibuprofen and I shouldn't have, but I was in so much pain that that was the only thing that could really help. And so my kidney function did escalate at that point. But then after about a month of drinking more water and taking, you know, staying away from the insets, it went back right back down to its normal. So um, that was amazing. Yeah, but that's that's so amazing. So but, just for everyone out there is considering it like you can go on and have a healthy life and thrive and just keep it moving. If you donate, that's that's wonderful to hear. I did want to touch upon something that you mentioned, just hearing the actual voice and what that actually feels like. That's happened to me at different times of my life. And the last time it happened to me was actually right before well, I, I was just on my second date with my husband and we were at some janky dive bar and I, I really liked him. I thought he was great, but it was the second date. I didn't really know much about him. And as we were sitting together, I heard in my head as loud and as clear as a bell, I just love you so much, Jeremy. And it was my own voice. And it was again, so loud. I actually popped up out of my seat 
And I said, excuse me. And I just went to the bathroom and I kind of just rocked a little bit in the bathroom because it was <laughs> such a strange thing. I heard my own voice saying in such a loving way how much I loved him again on my second date. And so I had kind of a, a little bit of a view into the future and I knew, oh, this is potentially, well, this is my guy. And of course we went on to get married and we are still together today, but it can happen. And I think that I've also heard what I think scripture would call that still small voice, which is just that mm -hmm. knowing that comes through right inside of you, just prompting you forward or in a certain direction. And I think we all have access to this, but mm -hmm. we just need to train ourselves to notice and to mm -hmm. listen and then to act upon it, which a lot of us also don't do. So do mm -hmm. you find in your own life that you hear this type of a voice or this type of wisdom often? And can you explain how that is? And if there's anything that you can do to kind of amplify that in your life? Yes. Uh, I hear voice. I hear voices all the time now. <laughs> and not Yay. in a bad way, not in a bad way. I'm not schizophrenic. I um, eventually learned about the Akashic Records. And I call the Akashic Records my digs. It's my house. I go within. It's my divine inner guidance system. And everybody has access to it. It's their own inner guidance system. And basically the Akashic records are, people call it, think of it the, as a library or a place, but it's not. It's within, it's without, it's everywhere. It's all knowledge. It's everything you've ever thought, done, and said, or will think, do, and say, all held for you to access. Your guides are there. Your loved, you can meet loved ones there. Um, and, it, and it's a place within. And I teach people now how to access the, the, the records. I also do Akashic Record readings, but I really love empowering people to learn how to hear that still small voice within. And one way is through meditation by quieting the mind. But the other way is I go every morning into the records. I open up my records within and I ask questions and I channel those answers. And the answers are always one that I would not have come up with on my own. It's always very loving and it's like a 360 degree panoramic view of, of, a, of an issue or a situation that I bring. And the one thing that I always hear is always, always, always choose love. Whatever you're doing, if you do it from a place of love, then you're doing it from your higher self. Uh, even whatever intent you have, as long as it's done with love, then you're doing it from a place of your higher self. But everybody has access to the records. And like I said, I, I teach people how to do that as well as also give readings. But my, my passion is teaching people to go with it because it's a, it's a still quiet place and it can be anywhere. God gave us an imagination. We mm. get to use it. That's how we connect with um, our loved ones, with our guides, with God. We can actually hear God's voice. I honestly believe that it was God's voice that told me I would be the one to donate. It was not my voice. It was definitely not something I would say to myself. And it happened. And we were a one in 20 million match. But so when you say that you go into your records, is mm -hmm. that, would you, I know it's, it's being facilitated through the function of the imaginal, but mm -hmm. do you think that you are, what you're doing is clicking into a dimension or do you think you're clicking into a frequency? Yes. What, what do you think, where, where do you think you're actually going? You're actually raising your vibration and you're going into a different dimension. I actually, I mean, there's a process that I go through in order to access it. Some people use prayers. There's prayers that I've used. Some people um, use a specific meditation uh, that they listen to in order to do it. Uh, when you go, I don't know if you've ever had Reiki, but people who use Reiki are actually tapping into that dimension. Um, mediums are tapping into that dimension. Um, if you're a parent and you sometimes you just you have a knowing that there's something wrong with your child, you're tapping into that dimension. It's it, it's called the fifth dimension. There's the fourth. We live in the third dimension. Everything's the physical realm. It is solid. Everything appears physical, you know, solid because it's moving so slow, which is why it takes a while to manifest desires. 
Then there's the fourth dimension, which is where our mind resides. And we can time travel from the past, the present, the future, and we can go back and forth. And then there's the fifth dimension where the Akashic records are held. And there's many other dimensions that go higher and higher. But what I do is I actually, I surrender my egoic self, my fears, everything. And I really, I feel like it's like a feeling of, whew, I can't explain it. That leaves me. And then I shift and I literally say the word shift in my head and I actually feel myself rising and I go up on top of a mountain and that's where I meet my guides and my loved ones. And there's the Lords, the masters and the loved ones of the Akashic records that preside over the records. Lord Metatron, which is an archangel. He's the gatekeeper of the, of the records. And that's where you can meet angels as well. And your, and your angel guides, your spirit guides. Um, I mean, and everything that you've ever wanted to know about yourself is there and they're there to support us because our spirit guides and our loved ones have obviously they have incarnated at one time or another. And so they know what it's like to live in this third dimensional world as spirits in a human body. They know how difficult it can be. They know the, um, the karma that we build up. And so they're there to help us because they can see everything from the mountaintop. Literally. I call it the Goodyear blimp sometimes <laughs> because from the good Goodyear blimp, you can see the entire Macy's Day Parade from the very beginning float all the way down to Santa Claus, you know, and you could see how it, you know, which road they're on and, you know, the way that they're going. Whereas when you're at street level and you're watching the parade go by, you can only see what's right in front of you. Right. So this, this process literally takes you up out of your, out of the forest, because when you're in the forest and you're trying to figure out what, whether to go right or go left, and you don't know which path to take by going into the records, you go up in the Goodyear blimp and you can look at the different pathways. You can see where the potholes are going to be or where the big mountains are going to be or, you know, where the where they're going to be digging or, or whatever is going on on that pathway. You can see what the obstacles are going to be so you can better prepare. And it's all about what it, what you want to experience because we are the divine creators of our own experience. We get to create what it is that we want to see in everything that's in your world, in your sphere of reality, you have created through your thoughts, <laughs> through your actions. You have, if you want something different, you have to take new action. And the action comes from, one, you can either do it through your egoic self, or two, you can ask for help and guidance, and they can show you the path. Does that make for a it long, does it, long it, way it, to answer that question? Sorry. No, no, no. I, I love it. I'm listening to all of it. I do have one quick question. Is there a mm -hmm. dog with you? There is. What kind of doggy? He sounds big, or she sounds like she's a big one. I hear her I groaning. Two. I have two. That was probably oh. Buddy. He okay. is. Um, <laughs> he's a black lab hound mix, and then there's Charlie. He's laying in the other room. Oh my gosh. We love dogs here. I've got a great Dane and an English Mastiff and they groan like that. So I had to ask, <laughs> but what I, what I wanted to ask along, um, these uh, lines with regard to the Akashic records, would you say the records are a place of information and perspective and vantage point, or can you also do work there? For example, if I want to go up and do some ancestral healing or like align some timelines or clear some stuff from past lives in order to free up my experience in this moment, can you do the work there? Or is it really just about getting information, bringing it down and changing your life in 3D? Yes and no. You can do both. I have done a lot of ancestral healing in the records. They have shown me Sometimes I'll ask a question and I'm like, well, what is the meaning of this? What can I learn from this? How can I see this from a different uh, perspective? You know, where has this pattern started? And sometimes I'm shown like kind of like a movie format almost of a past life. And I'm like, okay, well, how do I clear that? What do I need to do to clear? And there's times where they will actually give me the clearing right then and there. Other times they'll wait until after I've gone to sleep or at another time. But 
it's the knowing because once you know that something exists and why you're doing what you're doing, then you can start taking new action to do something different. And so you're not, the dogs are getting ready to bark. <laughs> the mailman just dropped off my, oh, they didn't bark. Just dropped off my mail. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, don't um, worry about it. <laughs> So yes, you can do all of that. And it's really interesting because your guides know what you need. And we, I believe that we incarnate to be able to experience ourselves as separate because when we're in heaven, every, we're all one. We're, we come from the same ocean. We're one. And in order to experience ourselves, we have to incarnate into these physical bodies where there's separation, there's physical separation. And We've had many, 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 many lifetimes. The majority, the, most of us have had many lifetimes of experiences that we can draw on. Some are good, some are bad, some are, and, and good or bad is relative too. <laughs> it's really based off of who you are at a soul level. And for me, I mean, like I said, I had, I had this terrible issue with not feeling good enough to receive money. And money would come and money would go. Money would come and money would go. And I was literally shown a past life where I was a, a, an older woman who came from lots of money. And I needed to feel loved, to feel wanted. So I had a lot of people who depended on me for many things. My kids, my family, my husband, my, you know, all this that I was the stoic leader of the family legend. And I, and the image they showed me was I was looking out of a window and I made a promise to never ever be rich again, because I correlated that with all the trouble in my life. If I didn't have this money, then people wouldn't be using me. They wouldn't be dependent on me. I wouldn't have responsibilities. I mean, there was a lot of, of things that were going on in that lifetime. So for me, my guides, they were able to show me that lifetime. I was able to clear it, clear the, 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 the vow that I made that day, release it. And now I feel worthy. Money can come, but money can go. Also, I can give it away because what you, what you give you or what you, re what you give away, you also receive back a hundredfold. But there's a difference now where that feeling of not being good enough or not being worthy of it is no longer there. And it just mm. shifted like that because of the clearing that I did. Does that make sense? Wow. Yes. And it just opens up just the potential of, of all the things that you can bring into alignment if you work within your records. I will say that gosh, maybe 20 years ago, I did a certification in Akashic re readings. And I think I did Linda Howe. Was that her name? Linda mm -hmm. Howe. She wrote the book yep. and then she had her little programs. I took the program and I remember working with a specific mentor and I didn't get it at the time because it felt like she was asking me to go someplace, get there now. What do you see? And so it really felt like I was looking for something outside of myself. But what mm -hmm. it sounds like you're describing is very similar to what Jesus says as well, which is like the kingdom of heaven is inside of you. Like all of the good stuff, the mechanics for everything are mm -hmm. right inside of you. And so a change of perspective in that way. Also, the sense that the Akashic Records is this some lofty hall of records, you know, which can make you feel like, oh, do I even belong in a place like that? But when you mm -hmm. reframe that to you know this, all the infrastructure of this exists inside of you and you've got a direct channel right to it, that changes the familiarity like oh no i have every right to go in and look at my life and look at my lives and see what i want to change and move around giving you the power therefore as the consciousness to be intentional about what you seek to create that's what i, I really love i really love how you're talking about the akashic records because it's much more personal and intentional than mm -hmm. how i learned it to be so many and i'm sure i i was just not ready for it at the time mm -hmm. but it just feels like it's a little different in that way if that makes sense. Yes. And, and the, the great thing is, is the teacher will appear when the student is ready. Yes. You know, and I always believe that when I'm ready for something, the tools will just appear. And 
I trust, and it's taken me a while to get here, but I trust that I am fully, I am abundant just by being me. Just by being spirit, I am abundant and I will always be taken care of. That fear now has been lifted, I guess. So I know that, and every now and then it'll sneak back in and like, oh, I'm not quite worthy enough to teach this workshop or do this or do that. What would, what would, why are people going to listen to me? What do I have to offer? Those are the work of the ego. And, they're tr and, the, and the thing of the ego is it's trying to protect you because it wants to live too. And, you know, so I work with her and I'm like, okay, let's look at this from a different perspective. Today, I welcome the opportunity to share my truth, to be my authentic self. And then that little pesky fear just kind of goes away because I'm stepping into what I believe is true for me and allowing my higher self to really guide what it is I'm doing from here. But in order to experience life, we have to have this ego. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. <laughs> sure. It helps us to survive in this particular yeah. dimension and in this, in this matrix, if you will. I wanted to ask you, I know that individuals have access to the Akashic records. I'm wondering whether the planet has its own Akashic records and humanity. And to that end, because I see you nodding. Mm -hmm. And if you've looked, <laughs> do you have access to the planet's Akashic records? And can you comment at all about what in the world is going on in the planet right now? Because, you know, I'm old enough to have been around and cognizant before the internet, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I grew up in the seventies and the eighties. I'm watching everything unfold now, you know, the emergence of AI, the absolute disruption that's happening in politics and eth ethnicities and the divisive, it seems just so critical and acute. Of course, we know this is an illusion and it's all just kind of teaching us something, but I wonder if what's happening now is revealed in the records and if you've had a peek and if you can comment at all about <laughs> that. Um, everything that has history, that has breath, has an Akashic record. And the... The planet we can access because it is it is the we consciousness. I cannot access your records without your permission, nor would I want to. But the world in general, even politics has its own Akashic record. Um, the individual politician has their own Akashic record, but I can't access theirs. It's, there's a firewall that's up for lack of better terminology. Um I have had glimpses of things that will have you know, what my guides are telling me are happening. But the, the key for me is, is I live in the Amy Gray Cunningham play. And so all of the characters that are in my play are invited into this, this performance. Now, each of these characters have their own play that's going on and we're all invited into that play which creates the collective consciousness and each person has their own role within this collective consciousness play per se and if we come to it from a place of love we can see things from a completely different perspective when I look at certain politicians and I think, Oh God, what are they doing? <laughs> they're going to, they're going to be the, the, the ruin of the world. The world's going to blow up because of this one politician, but thank God that one politician is here because that one person is teaching the rest of us patience, love, tolerance. The fact that we have the right to vote and to get out there and vote and vote our consciousness. I mean, that's huge. And a lot of people don't realize the impact that they have as one spirit being in this human body by being able to go out and vote. There's many countries in the world where people incarnate into those countries and they don't have that right. They are told who is going to be the next 
president or king or queen or whatever. They're told and they live by that. And that's, but that's the life they choose and have chosen. And at one point you probably have lived as a king or a queen or, I mean, there's so, it's so awesome because we get to come back as different characters each time we incarnate and we get to affect other people's plays if they allow us. The, what's going on in the world today, I look at it from a place of love. Mother Teresa says, and I've used her quote several times over the past few weeks, if you're creating a war rally, I'm not interested in going. But if you invite me to a peace rally, I will be there. And I love that saying, and I've unpacked it in so many different ways. And basically that means Anything that I find that I come across that's not in alignment to love, if I love that, that person, that place, that thing, that ailment, whatever it is, it can't exist anymore as fear or hate or anger. It can only exist as love. I don't know mm. if that makes sense, but it does. So I am constantly putting people and for me to judge somebody as right or wrong is my ego because that person that I'm looking at is a reflection of me. So I need to ask my guides, what is it in that person that I'm seeing in myself that I don't like? What is it in that person that is a reflection of me? What is it that I need to learn? And it always comes back to me. Always, always, because I am the main character in the Amy Gray Cunningham play. I think that is very powerful. <laughs> I subscribe. I love uh, a teacher named Neville Goddard. May he rest in mm -hmm. peace. And he, he always said, everything is just you pushed out. And in so, everything is just an opportunity for you to connect more deeply with your inner world. And the only way anything changes on the screen of your life, be it your health, your wealth, your country, the only way that changes is if it's first changes within you. And so every antagonist you meet or see on the television is just projecting something back to you, giving you the opportunity to bring something into alignment to change what is showing up in your world. Mm -hmm. But I find that so many people really chafe to this idea because they would say, well, why would I ever want to create my abuser? Why would I ever want to create a situation in which I am suffering? That just doesn't make any sense to me, which I can understand. And we can have this conversation because I think that we need to. But I think the reason people don't like to look at it that way is because it requires personal accountability. Like if I want to, if I want to change my material reality, I must change myself. I have to bring into alignment my limiting beliefs of self and others. Like I've got to go in and do the excavation around that, but that's hard. That means I've got to face some uncomfortable truths. And so I think 99% of people don't want to do that. And they also use the excuse of, well, why it can't be true because why would I create it in the first place? So that's kind of a convoluted way to get to. <laughs> what do you think about someone who says, well, why would I ever create my own abuser? That doesn't make sense as a soul. And I get asked that a lot because I'm constantly saying life doesn't happen, happen to us. It happens for us. And we create everything that we see in our life. We are very, very powerful creators. We were created in the image of God. God is the most supreme powerful creator and we're created in his image, her image. So we are powerful creators just by our thoughts alone. And as an ego, I would never create my abuser. Um, the, it just doesn't seem right I, I, on an egoic level. From a soul's perspective, from a higher perspective, when you go into the, into the records and you ask, what is it I'm supposed to learn from this situation? One, I call it bus stop conversations where before we incarnate, before our spirits come into this physical form, we have conversations with other people because we're like, okay, well in this lifetime, I'm choosing to play the role of the, you know, the abuser. I, I want to know what it's like to have power over somebody. I want to experience, and this is totally way off. I mean, I'm just creating a scenario, 
because I need to learn to forgive myself. Say I come into the situation, I'm like, oh, okay, I'll help you because I need to learn to be more forgiving as well and more loving and whatever. So I say, okay, and then we go off on our way. We incarnate and our souls have made this contract, for lack of better words, and we can always change it if we want to because we have free will in this world. But our souls really want us to experience like what it means to forgive as a, as a human being. And so we will create drama in our play to fulfill what it is we really want to, to, to experience and to understand and to know. And so even for like myself, I've had situations in my past where I was the victim quote unquote, of certain, of certain acts that had happened to me. And I have forgiven those people because it really, there really wasn't an act to forgive at a soul level, at a physical level. I can look, I mean, it could be woe is me if I wanted it to be, or I can look at it as a lesson for me to learn forgiveness. Because ultimately, I think that's one of the reasons we're all here is to learn to be love and to give forgiveness for not only others, but for ourselves. Because the act that, quote unquote, happened to you or happened to me didn't really happen. It's only a dream. And one day I'm going to wake up and I'm going to run into this soul that had created this, quote unquote, grievance towards me. And we're going to hug it out because we did, they did their job, you know? Yes. Yes. And they, they did what they had agreed to do. And I, I also believe, and I have come to find out through the passing of my husband that we do go through uh, a, a life review where we experience what everybody in our play has experienced. So we can see what it was like for that grocery store clerk who was having a really bad day because they had an argument with their wife and they were being snippy with me at the grocery store. So I took my, my aggravation out on him and it became a really big thing when it really didn't need to be. So I can see it from his perspective, what he was going through. And it's not to make me feel bad, but it's for us to feel what it's like to forgive and walk in the shoes of somebody else. That's why I always say, try not to judge because there go, there go I. Right. Right. Well, I often wish we could have that faculty now, <laughs> like yeah. just the presence of mind to realize what my action in this moment is doing to or for someone else. But I believe we can also cultivate that for sure. It's just that we really haven't done that because this illusion is so overpowering. And mm -hmm. I wanted to also comment with regard to the people who play the roles in our lives. You know, I spent the first 30 years of my life just being so reactive and upset about my father, who was the prime abuser in my life and created the person that I was, which was a broken person and just nuts. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, much later and with some learning and mentorship that I realized, oh, he signed up for that job. And it must have been as a soul, I'm sure it wasn't a bummer, but like he had to go into that knowing I'm going to be playing this dastardly role and doling out these terrible punishments to people. But I'm willing to do that because of the lessons that I get to learn as a soul and everybody else gets to learn as a soul. And so at this late date in my life, I can sincerely so clearly say, oh, thank you, dad. Like, I get it. I, I'm so thankful and grateful. Without you, I would not be who I am now. And so I think that developing the facility to really regard all of these antagonists and people in our life, as well as the ones who brought us joy from that perspective is so, so empowering overall. So thank you. Thank you for touching upon that. Now you've mentioned a couple of times in this conversation, angels and spirit guides. And if we could, you could see my whole back wall, you'd see a Metatron's cube right over here, but I'm, I'm totally into it. I dig it. Um, some people think they don't have a guide or that they don't have access to angels. And so how did you discover your first guides? Was it in the Akashic Records? Was it in a different way? Can you kind of elaborate on these high beings who are helping us behind the scenes? 
The first time I met my spirit guide, Jonathan, where I was in a session with my mentor at the time, and she was a medium and she would do, um, she channeled for, for angels and guides. And as soon as I met him, I knew exactly who he was. And he is, um, his name is Jonathan and he's a black jazz music musician. And he always says, Hey baby, <laughs> I can hear him laughing now. Hey baby. And he wears, you know, like a little black cap and the glasses and he loves the saxophone. And when I connect to him with listening to jazz music, I can feel his energy flowing through me. And he's always been with me. And it's really interesting because when I was in the reading, she said, and you know, Jonathan, because he was a blue dog. And I know that sounds weird, but when I was a kid, I received um, uh, a teddy bear or a blue dog that, and that was Jonathan. And I called it, his name was Jonathan. <laughs> That's what I call oh, wow. him. What, what three-year-old kid names their teddy bear Jonathan, you know? Um, but that was, and I would talk to him and he was my protector and he would help me. And I absolutely, and I, and I loved that blue dog and I would take him everywhere with me. In fact, I remember one time I went to go to my grandparents' house and we were living in uh, Rochester and they lived in Syracuse, New York. And I left Jonathan at home and I would not go to sleep until my grandfather drove back up to Rochester to get Jonathan and bring him back down. <laughs> That's how I couldn't sleep without him. He was, he was my everything. And so as soon as she said that, I was like, Oh my God, that's him. That is so him. And now I have this relationship with, with Jonathan that I can hear his voice. He buzzes in my left ear. My husband buzzes in my right ear. Um, and I know that he has a message for me or he has, or I'm doing something that he wants me to pay attention to where something is getting ready to happen that he wants me to experience and to pay attention to. So I always cue in on, on both of those, those sounds in my ears. So if he um, has a message for you and you realize it cause you get the buzzing, how do you then stop and get the message and integrate it? I immediately stop. I hear the, the buzzing and I allow it to continue on. And I just say, I welcome the opportunity for whatever message it is that you're trying to send me at this time. And then I breathe and I let it go. And sometimes I'll hear it audibly. Sometimes I will, I will see a number or there'll be a bird that flies by or there'll be, um, it's just, it's amazing the different things that Jonathan has brought into my sphere of reality. Because remember, this is all a play and it's kind of like, um, oh, what is the name of that, um, that movie, Agnes, some, so oh, and so. God? No, um, no, no, um, they're, they're two, they're two people and they go into like this, this, uh, this war zone or whatever they're dropped in there and you have to fight to the death and there's all these different things that happen. Um, and everybody stands around and watches. It's like a futuristic movie. I can't think of it. Agnes Cagnagy or something like that. Um, oh, I cannot think of the name of the movie. It'll come That's to me okay. later. Some, someone will write in. <laughs> yeah. Someone will know. <laughs> but it, it, you go, it, and, and you can send them like lifelines, different lifelines or different, um, uh, things within. And that's what the spirit guides do. They can send you lifelines or different, um, symbols or things that can help you in the moment that, that you're going through. And so just by being aware to how they work with you, knowing what their energy feels like in your body and what the energy feels like outside of your body. Um, cause I've asked Jonathan to actually step out of my energy field so I could feel like it, what it's like without him in it. And then also then step back in so I can tell the subtle difference. And I know the difference. I know when I'm working with Jonathan and when I'm not, because we've been doing it for so long and he'll send me lifelines and kind of like, um, you know, phone a friend or something. Sure. <laughs> Get the phone a guide. So would you say everyone has a spirit guide? Yes. Everybody is born with one. Um, you, most people have up to six, but some people can have even more depending on what you're working on at the time. Somebody who is like a doctor may have a bunch of different, um, guides at the time working with him. 
the things with, with the guides and the angels is you really have to ask them for your, for their help. They won't, they can't infringe on your own free will because that is the one gift that God has given us that cannot be changed, thwarted, anything. It is, that is it. So, um, you have to ask them and invite them to help unless you're getting ready to go into a dangerous situation that is going to take you off of your spirit path. They can intercede at that time. And I've had, I remember I had a little red car, convertible car that was really fast. And I was at a stoplight getting ready to turn left. And I did not see this car coming. It came out of nowhere when I was turning left. And all of a sudden, I literally felt like a hand on my leg and my car just floored. And I was through that intersection. And right as I passed it, that car went flying by. I mean, it must have been going 100. And it's, I was like, my throat went into my stomach at that point. I was like, holy mackerel. Um, and I was like, immediately, thank you. I didn't have to ask. <laughs> right. It just happened. So in certain instances like that. But now I've worked with Jonathan and my my guides and angels for so for for a while now that I can feel when they're helping and I can hear it I can see it and then working with the different angels like Metatron I mean I love working with Metatron and you me can too really, yeah and it's he's it's such a powerful force and Metatron is the um keeper the gatekeeper over the Akashic records and he was appointed by God Supposedly, that's what I've been told. Um, can Can you explain how you came by that information? Well, it's actually in the Bible. So I asked. I went into the records and I asked. And I was kind of shown like a movie of how Metatron, because Metatron was at one time um, a human being. And he, he became an angel. And then God appointed him to... Um, preside over the Akashic records, the, the book of the all knowing. Um, and, um, which is, which is, which is cool. And he's such a powerful force for me. He comes through as like a really dark purplish blue and feeling. And he's just all love. All the angels are all love, but he's very impactful. And I also work with Archangel Arion or Orion, O R I O N. You know, recently, which has been all about manifesting. He, he helps you with the power of manifesting. He's kind of like a genie that pops out of a bottle. <laughs> um, so he's, he's really a cool angel to work with as well. Awesome. Well, one last question for you um, is around your intuitive healing, because I know that's part of your bio. And I know you mm -hmm. do Akashic Records, and I can see that all of this intersects, I am sure. But what kind of intuitive healing do you do? And, and how does that work? I, do, I work with people when I do Akashic Record readings and in that we go into, you know, how God created your soul to manifest and I help to clear any blocks and restrictions that are keeping you from moving into that manifestation. And then I also do a coaching process and it is, uh, it's a trans, it's a 12 week transformational process and it goes through, uh, the, the stages of the butterfly and which is really kind of cool. But in each week, I, I work with you on how to access the records. And we also do intuitive healing. If I see that there's blocks or strings of energy that need to be removed from a certain situation, I'm able to help do that with the help of my guides and your guides. And I do do attunements to help raise your vibration so it's a little easier for you to access the records and to clear those channels. And I work with you on you know, how to clear your channels on your own. And when I mean channels, I mean your chakras within your body. And we are all attached by energetic streams. You and I are attached right now by an energetic stream. And, you know, when the call is over with, it usually will be cut. And then we go on our, our, our way. We won't feel that energy in our bodies. But sometimes we come across people like the guy at, you know, the grocery store that gets in our field because he's angry and he's mad. And we allow his energy to attach to us. And we carry that with us. And it can pull us down. And so when I help people to learn to feel where they're off because they know their baseline and they're like, oh, God, I ran into that guy and da, 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 that happened. That's the attachment. And how do you clear that? And I teach them on how to, unclear, how to clear that. But I can actually see the energy streams that connect people, which is so cool. Mm -hmm. So wow. 
Well, this has been such a wonderful conversation. We've, we've covered a lot of different things, but at the final tally, I really love how your premise begins and ends with coming from a place of love, just coming from a place of love. And I 100% agree with that. And so thank you for sharing your message. Thank you for sharing so much cool insight. Um, if somebody would like to reach out and potentially work with you or get mentorship or coaching, or if you're teaching any programs, and if you're not, you should, you should be teaching programs, <laughs> but how would they, how can they find you on the internet and how can they connect with you? Uh, my website, amygraycunningham.com. Um, all of my services are offered there. The coaching program is not up there yet. So if you're interested in the coaching, you can email me at amy at amygraycunningham.com and I can send you more information on that. I'm having my website redone. So that's been taken down for the moment, but, um, it will be back up. I'm also doing a workshop. Uh, it's an in-person workshop in Charlotte. I don't know if any of the listeners are in Charlotte, but on September 18th at the sanctuary imports, I am doing a workshop on accessing your digs your divine inner guidance system. So I'll be teaching people how to do that. And then also October 15th, I have a beginner's workshop where I will teach you all about meditation and the different forms of meditation and why meditation is important to being able to access your, your Akashic records or your higher, your higher self. Wonderful. Um, I'll, I'll make sure to include all of your links and information in the description of this podcast on the description of my YouTube. So anyone who's interested, I know that I'm interested and fascinated. So anyone who's interested, please go and check out her website, connect with her and see what you can get into in those divine digs. So yeah. thank you so much, Amy. This has been a fantastic conversation and I really appreciate you stopping by Life Magnetics. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time.